Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Eamon Handar. As uh, Peter kindly introduced, I'm an economist at the IMF. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present our um, recent uh, work on uh, sustainable development uh, goals, costing and financing options um, here today. Um, the IMF is committed within its uh, mandate of macro stability and sustainable in and inclusive growth to uh, support the uh, SDGs. This uh, presentation um, emphasizes the role of fiscal uh, policy for sustainable development. As we will see in this presentation, the government budget is very important for development and fiscal policy uh, goals must go beyond stabilization. In undertaking the work presented here, we work closely with development partners like the World Bank. We also benefited from comments from Jeffrey Sachs from the United Nations. In addition, we worked closely with country uh, authorities in the context of five case studies, Vietnam, Indonesia, Guatemala, uh, Benin and uh, Rwanda. So the work presented here uh, summarized the main findings of the uh, staff discussion note that is being published uh, uh, late January, which is titled Fiscal Policy and Development, Human, Social and Physical Investment for the SDGs. Uh, prior to this publication, the initial main findings were also presented by uh, Madame Lagarde um, in, the, in the UN Nations meetings in uh, September last year. So, setting up the context for the origin of the 2030 Agenda, let me first highlight uh, the progress that had been achieved under the Millennium Development Goals. Um, as you can see from this chart regarding extreme poverty, globally since 1990, a billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. However, progress was uneven. In Eastern and Southern Asia, China and India, there has been a substantial reduction in uh, extreme poverty. In contrast, when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, progress has been limited, and this region is still among the, uh, among the, the countries with the highest uh, poverty uh, rates. In the same way, there has been a reduction in mortality uh, uh, rates, but again, the progress has been uneven and Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, lacking significantly. So, facing all these uh, challenging in key human uh, development areas and highlighting that there are also other key relevant uh, areas uh, for sustainable development that, and that these concerns are not only for low income and emerging market as was under the Millennium Development Goals, and also for advanced economies. In 2015, the global community agreed on a comprehensive agenda for implementing sustainable development goals with targets set in 2030. This built substantial on the progress achieved under the Millennium Development Goals, but also takes it one step further in several ways. First, it finishes the Millennium Development Goals, who had a target of going the so-called halfway in ending poverty. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals go further by uh, targeting ending poverty. It expands the number of goals from 8 under the Millennium Development Goals to 17 under the Sustainable Development Goals. It also includes issues that were previously not part of the agenda, such as climate uh, change and good governance. It applies, as mentioned, to every country, not only to uh, developing economies. And it also reflects deeper civil society participation compared to the Millennium Development Goals, as uh, the private sector should also be involved, especially in areas like climate uh, change. So are, they, are they ranked somehow? Or is there equal weight given to each? Yes, there is equal weight. There is, there, there's actually no weight. To, to be more precise. So it's not that one is more important uh, than the other. There is no, no uh, weight. But of course, all of them, and we will see that, are kind of interacting. It's not, uh, it's not uh, they are not independent from each other. And finally, it also expands the source of financing. Uh, 
where previously it was the main focus was from rich countries providing uh, financing to poor countries to help them out of poverty. Now the aim is also to look at resources within a country. So, first of all, not surprising, uh, economic growth is key for uh, development. SDG achievement is measured by the so-called SDG Composite Index, which is a score for the, for the 17 areas, as, we, as I highlighted just here. With zero is the worst performer and 100 is the best performance you can achieve. As you can see on the chart on the left, where you see the different income groups by um, low income, middle income, and advanced economies, is that countries with, with higher per capita income tend to have better SDG outcomes. And also, another important uh, message is that the dispersion in the SDG achievement across these countries is smaller as income increases. So on the right side, you will see the same countries um, where we look at the primary expenditure and the achievement under the SDG index. You will see that the higher the primary expenditure is, the higher the scores from SDG index. So that means that fiscal policy plays a crucial role. And this relation even holds uh, when we correct for um, income level of the different countries. So therefore, our view is that we need to have a comprehensive approach to development and fiscal policy should be designed in such a way that supports growth and development. Sorry, what is the primary expenditure? Primary expenditure is basically, it's, it's total expenditure minus interest payments. So we exclude interest payments as interest payments are a different type of expenditure. It's to repay debt and it does not, nece it does not go necessarily to, uh, to growth enhancing uh, spending. That's why we exclude here uh, uh, primary expenditure because in some countries this share is very high which um, makes the relationship difficult uh, to see. So, so the f shouldn't you include the interest payments? Because shouldn't you really look at that? Because that's where the burden lies. The reason that we don't look at it in this part, we, we're not saying the interest payments are not important. The reason that we don't look here at interest payments is because interest payments, by definition, is the repayment of debt. And what we are interested here is to see in areas where the government spends money in education, healthcare, even wages, goods and services, how does that relate to achieve um, uh, higher uh, scores on the SDG index? While um, interest payments are not helping you to, uh, to achieve fiscal policy objectives, interest payments is basically paying back previous uh, spending that you were not able to finance yourself. So that's, while it is a very important component, when we also look at the fiscal space, in this context our uh, aim is different. We want to see what is the relationship between the government investing basically and the SDG outcome. That's why we exclude it here, but obviously as you mentioned it's a very important area. Like it would be interesting to see the split between the primary and the interest payment. So you know, to see how much of the expenditure is accounted for, how much of the total expenditure is accounted for the interest payments and the primary. But yeah, that's, I, th I, I think f from another perspective, that's very interesting to see how much space there is in countries. And you will see that in some countries, indeed, the interest payments is as a share of uh, even tax revenues could be very high. So when you consider fiscal space, uh, how much room do you have to uh, finance the SDG agenda through increasing debt? That's indeed a um, component that we are uh, looking at. Sorry. So let me... Um. So 
and here you have the uh, interest rate by the by the way here at the top so it's not surprising that fiscal uh, policy is uh, important uh, for development for specific SDGs such as education healthcare um, it is important to see that countries, advanced countries that have a better SDG outcome, not only spend in percent of their GDP more on education, healthcare, and infrastructure, but also as a share of their total spending. So you will see that in, count in low developing countries, most of the spending does, or lower share than in advanced economies of the spending, goes to other items than the ones that are supporting uh, development. So this brings me to uh, two key questions. First, how much spending is required to make substantial progress towards the SDGs? In this presentation, we focus on five uh, sectors, health, education, infrastructure, infrastructure, which consists of electricity, roads, and water and sanitation. These five uh, sectors represent investment in social, human, and physical capital. And these are also more likely the ones where fiscal policy plays an important role and where there is, as we saw here, a large share of the budget going to these items. Um, the selected sectors are, uh, as mentioned, interacting with each other. For instance, uh, there are spillovers of, uh, on poverty and gender inequality from ra raising uh, education investments. For instance, when you try to, as a country, try to increase um, enrollment rates in tertiary education, and you have more women at attending tertiary education, this will have also an impact on poverty and also on gender inequalities, uh, gender equality. So that's why there is a uh, synergy between them. The second question relates to what the role of national governments is and how can the private sector, civil society, and even the international community provide support uh, for achieving the sustainable development uh, goals. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I recently used unmet uh, data that the physical is to do a research. I should check the data quality is not very good. Uh, because I, I use like um, government expenditure on environmental protection. In, oh, sorry? Um, the government expenditure on environmental protection. And I found there are a lot of missing value. So, yeah. Um, yeah um, as we know, World Bank also have similar data like education expenditure. So is your data comparable to World Bank? It should be. In theory, uh, we collaborate a lot with the World Bank. The particular data that you're referring to is not data where we have been collecting a lot of uh, data so far. Um, this data, which is uh, basically the functional classification of budgets, it is data that we have in our statistics and in which countries are reporting on an, on an annual basis. It forms also uh, the basis of our world economic Outlook, which is one of the flagship uh, documents that we have. But the particular data that you are referring to, I'm not that surprised that you find missing values because I think even in many countries, when you go and ask them, they would not even know themselves how much they are spending. So that might be a reason that we don't have that much data and unfortunately missing uh, values. But this data on like expenditures, it's comparable with the World Bank data. Usually our numbers are very close and sometimes we rely on them. Sometimes we do cross-checking or they rely on us. So this is very, let me call it, very basic data, which is, we believe, and it's being cross-checked with also authorities. So this should be reliable. <laughs> so assessing the spending needs. Um, let me explain quickly the methodology that we are uh, using. Um, we have looked at the, so the, the mentioned five sectors and we have applied the methodology on 155 countries, 34 advanced economies, 49 low-income developing countries and 72 emerging markets. We followed a three-step approach. The first approach is for each sector, 
we assume that performance is a function of a mix of inputs and that each input has a unit cost. I will come to that in a second with an example. Then we derive reference values for those inputs and unit cost by setting these values at by, by setting these uh, values observed in countries with similar GDP per capita that have a high development outcome. Then for the country of interest, we estimate the spending in 2030, taking into account country specifics like demographics and the projected GDP in 2030. Let me give an example that makes it maybe easier uh, to understand. So, for instance, in education, one of the cost drivers is the teachers per, teacher per 100 students. We have here an example for countries with GDP per capita below 3,000. So, what we have seen is that in countries which has a high SDG 4 index, which is the education index, they have a high number of teachers per student. So, what we do in our methodology we, say, we look at the cost in these countries, how much it costs them to uh, spend on teachers per student, and we use these reference values for other countries. When doing that, we divide the group of countries in three, at low-income developing countries, emerging markets, and advanced economies. So the reason why we do that is because we want to have a realistic approach to costing. It wouldn't make sense in the medium term to compare a very poor country with an advanced economy. So that's why we divide the, the um, set of countries in uh, three. We apply this for each uh, sector. For instance, another example is in healthcare. In healthcare, the number of doctors, but also the salary of doctors, is a very relevant input in the cost of uh, healthcare. So we look at countries within the income group that perform well, and we use these references for other countries that have a lower SDG index. And we estimate, taking into account their population growth and also the young population growth, because that's very important for education, to see how much do would they need if they have the same unit cost to achieve the SDGs in 2030. So we do that for all the four sectors, except for the um, uh, water and sanitation. There we rely on the World Bank model that has an ex uh, extensive model in uh, estimating what the costs is of achieving uh, the sustainable development goals in the area of um, water and sanitation. Um, so the estimates that we present are additional annual spending in 2030. So additional relative to the current level of spending. And it's important to note that we don't look only at government spending, but we also look at private spending. And it's also important to, to note that the share of private spending is different depending on which sector you are looking. And if you are wondering why we include the private share, just to give an example, in many countries what we see is that private spending is also important, for instance, in healthcare. You go to the doctor, it is maybe covered by public spending largely, but you have a co-payment. Or when you go to the university, you still have a uh, tuition fee. And what we see is across countries is that the better the outcome is in terms of the SDGs, the lower the private share is spent on these sectors. And the, re the reason for this is twofold, because um, in countries where public spending is low, you see a lot of private schools, private hospitals. In countries that spend more on health and education and have better outcomes, you see that the private share is low, because either the, the population is covered by a national insurance system, or there are very good quality public schools, so you see that the share of private spending decreases. So the other point uh, which is important to note here is efficiency. 
when doing these estimates, we assume that countries are as efficient as the comparable benchmarks. Um, another thing is that we look at selected SDGs. As we have seen, there are 17 SDGs. The IMF looks only at five SDGs. So this could be a lower bounds of the cost to achieve the SDGs. And another uh, uncertainty is uh, surrounding the assumptions of the methodology itself, um, which are some technical assumptions that we need to make, and also growth projections. But also one input is the demographics, is the UN uh, growth po population uh, forecast, which is also could also have an uh, uncertainty. So when we look at some case studies, we uh, worked very closely with the authorities of five countries, as mentioned, um, Rwanda, Benin, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Guatemala. Uh, we went on missions and we discussed the country specifics. We validated the data that uh, we have. And these countries reflect different type of emerging and uh, developing countries, and also they they are uh, diverse in terms of geographical representation from Asia to Latin America to um, Africa. So on the right, you will see the spending needs for these countries, which are uh, very diverse. For Rwanda and Benin, it's around uh, 20%, while for Vietnam, Indonesia, and Guatemala, it's around uh, 6 to uh, 9%. And you will also see that the um, areas of focus are very different, like Rwanda and Benin, Guatemala. More investments are needed in uh, education, health, and roads, while in Vietnam and Indonesia, the focus is more on health care. And for instance, an interest, one interesting point in Indonesia was that um, they are spending quite a bit on uh, education, so their, prior their priority is more to look at how to improve uh, efficiency instead of how to increase spending. So applying this to the entire set of countries, the 155 uh, countries, you will see that you need significant resources to close the gap in terms of SDG outcomes. Um, there's a sharp contrast between low-income countries on one hand and emerging market economies on the other hand. Low-income developing countries need on average 15% of GDP to close the gap, while emerging markets need 4% uh, of GDP. And again, the spending needs are also different in low-income developing countries, education and healthcare is half of the spending needs, and roads, electricity and water is the uh, other half, which is um, especially for education related to the low uh, enrollment rates and for healthcare mainly infant mortality, maternity uh, mortality and also uh, the lack of sufficient uh, Food, food basically nutrition, high quality nutrition, which of course has also the spillover effects on education because in some countries where what we have seen is that when kids have not enough nutrition, they tend to not surprisingly not perform that well at uh, schools. Um, of course, as mentioned, we also look at advanced countries, but again, um, the, the needs and the focus is very different. When we apply this methodology on advanced economies, what we see is that the um, spending needs are either very small or negative. So a negative spending needs means basically that the country is relatively overspending on particular items. And to improve outcomes, it should focus not on spending more, but on increasing efficiency. And this is in particular um, the case for healthcare, where we see that the healthcare outcomes are lagging behind the amount of spending which is uh, spent on healthcare. 
And in many advanced countries, this is also related to healthcare technology to keep people longer alive, which is very costly, but which does not necessarily relate one-on-one -on -one in the SDG outcomes, as the SDG outcomes look at a variety of uh, issues. So there is not only a significant difference across income groups, but as you can see on, in this chart, there's also a significant uh, difference be between uh, country in, within country groups. For instance, if you look at emerging uh, markets economies, uh, I have highlighted here in blue the some Asian countries. And you can see that some of them have more than 20% of spending needs and other ones are around 4%. So it's a wide range. And in, in low-income developing countries, the same pattern. In s some cases, the spending re needs are above 50% of GDP, while in others, like in Vietnam, it's uh, around uh, less than 10%. So this shows that uh, it really depends on the country, on which stage of development the country is, how much the government currently spends, and also on some specifics like uh, the population growth. Like in some countries, like in the MENA region, uh, in, uh, you, you will see that there is a huge young population which needs higher spending uh, needs, especially for education. So, obviously, but growth matters. The level of uh, development in a, in, in, a, in a country matters for the size of the spending needs. So, we have done some uh, simulations and we saw that doubling GDP per capita in 2030 would bring down the um, spending need by 4.5% of GDP. So for emerging markets, this, this is mainly this total spending needs. However, this is also a risky approach if you would just wait for growth to become because it may not uh, materialize. Plus, by the time growth materializes, uh, you may have generations who have not benefited from it. So um, that's an issue to consider. So the spending needs... So sounds very high and on an individual country level they are very high but we also want to look at this from a global perspective um, so rather than looking at how how much percent it is in terms of the national GDP we would like to look at it from the perspective of world GDP so from a global perspective additional spending um, across emerging and developing uh, countries amounts to 2.6 trillion US dollars, which is 2.5% of the 2030 world's GDP. So it sounds uh, less demanding and less impossible, as I want to uh, call it. And for low-income developing countries, it's 528 billion US dollars, which is 0.5% of uh, 2030 world GDP. When we look at the regional um, needs, you will see that Asia has the largest needs in terms of the world GDP. And this is not surprising, even though in their national GDP um, they need only 4%, they, need the largest, they have the largest needs in terms of world GDP, which is obviously because they're GDP is bigger than in other uh, than in low and low um, income developing countries. So when you look at low income developing countries, uh, which is mainly the sub-Saharan Africa, you see that um, they account for almost the entire uh, bulk of the of the need. So it's around 0 0.4, and other countries, as the Middle Eastern and Europe, are uh, much less. So, putting all these... Yeah, why do you look at percentage of global? Because in the end, the country will have to achieve the growth themselves. That's where we are going next. <laughs> That's exactly where we are going next. Because 
That's what, yes, please. Uh, yeah, before you go into the next, could you explain your estimation method? Uh, do you say, um, um, do the regression on, like, say, as you go on, like, a variable of GDP um, uh, population, so on, and then you got coefficient, and then you calculate the same kind of estimation? Uh, not exactly, but it's kind of close. What we do is we have a few, four roads, infrastructure, we use a regression where we look at uh, the road density and there we assign the coefficients to the particular country and that's how we get the spending needs. In terms of the um, education and healthcare, we do it a little bit different. It's again the same methodology uh, in principle, but instead of a regression, what we use is we have an identity and if you're interested in uh, this, it, it's also in the, in the paper, in the annex. What we do is we have an identity which says um, spending uh, on education, for instance, is driven by a few components. The number of teachers, the salary of teachers, some kind of current spending, capital spending, just as a very broad, and then some other uh, smaller uh, spending items. And then what we do is we say, for instance, in emerging markets, the good performers, they have a student to teacher ratio of, let's say, 90. We see that that performance, performers have a much higher. So what we say then, if the country wants to be as successful as the benchmark in the group, it needs to have the same size of uh, classroom, for instance. So we assume that using the demographics from this particular country, you need to have a student per teacher ratio that's the same as a good performer. Then one thing is the number of teachers. And then we also look, okay, how much does in percent of their ca per capita GDP, the good performers spend on uh, teacher salaries? We assign that again to the low performers. We do the same with capital and current spending. We use the share that is being spent by, in, in the, by the good performers and we apply it on the less good performers, let me call it that way. And doing that, we also take into account their own dem demographics, like the number of uh, students that you will have in 2030, and we use the UN uh, population uh, growth projections for this. And that's how we get to what should be your um, spending if you want to be as successful as the uh, good performer. Of course... You said the benchmark, right? And then see how, how to achieve that. Yes. So basically what we are saying, and we will, um, we will get uh, to that, basically what we are saying is if you use the same inputs and you compensate them at the same way, you should be able to achieve the same results. I will come to that as it has a caveat, but I will ex explain that, and I will show some scenarios. So, financing of the SDGs, which is the main challenge, among other things. So, first of all, let's look at the tax revenues of uh, countries. So, tax revenues uh, vary cr uh, widely across uh, different groups, like for low income developing countries, the tax to GDP ratio is, uh, the median is 15%. For emerging markets, it's uh, 18%. And for advanced economies, uh, 26%. The average for uh, Asian low income and developing countries and emerging markets is 16.6% .6 of GDP. Um, so it's important to note that some progress has been made. For instance, in low income developing countries since 2000, the tax to GDP ratio is increased from 12 to 15% um, of GDP. Um, what we have seen is, uh, based on our experience from mainly my colleagues who are working on the ground with countries to increase tax to GDP ratios, is that increasing the tax to GDP ratio by five percentage points over the, the next decade is an ambition, ambitious but reasonable um, approach and it is uh, realistic to uh, achieve that. However, uh, let me go. However, uh, 
The 5% of GDP, which would be sufficient for emerging markets to close their gap in terms of the financing needs, but it's not um, enough for um, the uh, low-income developing countries. So, as, as you will see um, here, for them, even if they mobilize uh, revenues, as you can see here, this is their total gap. If they increase by five, if they increase their tax revenues by around five percentage points, which still implies that they need to um, implement many measures in terms of tax policy, tax administration, building uh, the legal frameworks, reducing um, informality, they still have an additional. Uh, need to f that is uh, unfinanced. So given this gap, it's very important that resources uh, will be mobilized uh, from the private sector, offic official uh, development assistance and international financial institutions. So let me turn now to spending efficiency. It's not only that the country should focus on the revenue side, it's also important to look at the spending uh, side because um, when I just explained the methodology how to achieve the SDGs, I mentioned that we attain the inputs and the costs using in good performer countries to countries that are performing less in SDGs. But this implies also that you need to have some kind of spending efficiency um, because the good performers have a particular spending efficiency. So if you want to translate this, the costs in the same outcomes, you need to have more or less the same efficiency. And what we are looking here is that what happens if the efficiency, and here again we don't compare the low-income countries with efficiency in advanced economies, we compare them with the efficiency of good performance in their own country group. So, and what you see that is that if even if they use the same resources as the good performers, but if they are less efficient, the cost increases significantly. It increases from 15% of GDP to 25% of GDP. In emerging markets, it increases from 4% of GDP in the baseline that we have presented here, to 6% of GDP. If countries are more efficient, of course, the cost uh, decreases in both cases. But I would say that's a nice benefit. But you cannot necessarily rely on that. So to summarize our uh, findings, there are uh, large efforts uh, needed. And it's also important um, to say that uh, while the efforts are very large on a national basis, we believe that if we look at this from a global perspective, the efforts are manageable, especially if, t if countries would increase their uh, official development assistance towards the UN target of 0.7% of GDP. And I also need to note that currently only four or five countries are at that target. Um, raising tax revenues, as mentioned, is an important um, pillar, but it's not uh, enough for low-income developing countries. So therefore, it's important to involve all key stakeholders, the international community, but also the private uh, sector, which has also a role to play in, for instance, uh, infrastructure in uh, financing public-private uh, partnerships. So finally, let me leave you with some key challenges. Um, even if the resources are available, one imp very important issue is, of course, that countries need to own the SDGs. So having only the, f only the financing is not a silver bullet. Countries should focus on uh, strengthening the macroeconomic environment, enhancing tax uh, capacity, tackling spending inefficiencies, but also addressing corruption uh, that in undermines inclusive growth and making sure that there is enough capacity to use the resources efficiently. Obviously, we didn't talk here about the trajectory 
towards uh, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. But obviously, it's not always possible for a country to increase spending immediately from a very low level to a high level without losing um, uh, resources and without inefficiency. So there's a lot that has to be um, done, but it's very important that there is a, that uh, the international community supports this, the IMF supports this, and that there is a comprehensive approach to the SDGs. And lastly, as I mentioned, it's important um, that all aspects has to be taken into account from good macroeconomic environment to uh, finding uh, resources to uh, finance the SDGs.